bipolar junction transistor, the short form is BJT. So let me tell, there are two types of transistor. One is bipolar transistor, the bipolar junction transistor BJT. Another one is field effect transistor or FET. So bipolar junction transistor consists of two PN junction. If you see the PN junction diode, we have only one PN junction. Okay, but the bipolar junction transistor, it consists of two PN junction. Okay, so you can see it. We have three terminal in BJT that is called emitter, base and collector. Whereas for diode, we have only positive and negative terminal or simply anode and cathode terminal. But here, we have a third terminal. You can say that is the base terminal. Okay, so we are giving the name of those terminals that is emitter base and collector an interesting thing is that the entire working mechanism of bjt okay where, where the bjt will be conduct where the bjt is on or off that totally depends upon this property of those pn junctions means whether the pn junction is on means the forward biased or they are reverse bias okay the working mechanism of bjt depends upon that so and the basic working mechanism, the current flow through the BJT, basically controlled by the base terminal. The base we can say that is a controlling terminal. Okay, and see the name indicates the emitter. Emitter will emit. Okay, emit what? It will emit carrier. Emitter will emit the carrier, and those carriers will be collected in the collector terminal. So the name indicates that role of collector is to collect the carrier we need to apply some voltage in such a way okay the carriers coming from emitter side will be collected and the collector side okay and see in between emitter and collector okay the base region is there so of course the base will control the flow of carrier between emitter and collector so base is the controlling terminal how the current will flow how much current will flow so we can say base is the controlling terminal of transistor. Now there are two types of transistor. As you can see the diagram, depending upon the doping you are using or the NNP region you are using, the first one is NPN. See, the N is emitter type is N type doped, base is P type doped, and collector is N type doped. Second one, the bottom one is PNP transistor. The emitter is P type, base N type and collector in time, uh, e time so those are the first basic fundamental things related to bjt so bjt stands for bipolar junction transistor it is having three terminal emitter base collector there are two types of bjt one is npn another one is pnp there are two base there are two pn junctions are present one junction is called the base emitter junction or emitter base junction. Second one is base collector junction or collector base junction. What? This is the symbol of transistor. See, every semiconductor device having some symbol. We, we know the symbol of diode. We know the symbol of general diode. We, we know the symbol of resistor, capacitor, inductor. Similarly, the transistor having some symbol. First thing is that, see, the shape is same. The symbol type is same. Only the difference in arrow. Okay, only the difference in an arrow. See, the arrow will be present in emitter terminal. In transistor, always the arrow will be in emitter terminal, not in base or collector terminal. So, the arrow will be present only in emitter terminal, not in any other terminal. And the current direction, see, that means the arrow is present in between base and emitter terminal. And the direction will be from P side to N side. Check for NPN transistor, first one. Okay, the current flowing from P to N, that is from base to emitter. That means the arrow is in a downward direction. Okay, outward direction. Okay, current flowing from base to emitter. Okay, for NPN. Similarly, for PNP transistor, see the semiconductor is just uh, changed. Now we have a P type emitter and N type base, the bottom one PNP transistor. And the current will flow from P to N side. Current will not flow from N to P. Current will flow from P to N side. So, if it is not forward bias, if it is reverse bias, then the BJT will not work. It's just off. 
to switch on the VJT, the first condition is you have to make the base emitter junction forward, irrespective of your NPN or PN. So if, if the VJT is NPN, just the voltage polarity will change. Okay. And if the VJT is PNP, then you have to change the polarity of the battery. That's all. Now coming to some construction, some basic points. The area of collector is always larger compared to emitter and base. So you can see the diagram in the previous picture, though it looks uh, almost same. But in reality, the area of collector region okay, is always larger compared to the base region or emitter region. The reason is, since at the collector terminal, we are collecting the carrier, so you can say simply, we are taking the output from collector terminal. So VJT, when we are designing some VJT circuit, we are taking the output from collector terminal in most of the cases, except a few special cases. So the power dissipation will be larger in the collector terminal, in the collector region, because it will deliver a large amount of current and all those things. That's why you need to make the collector region quite large so that the amount of heat generated, okay, it will be quickly disappeared. And the base region from area point of view, the base region is very thin. The base region is very thin compared to your emitter and collector. And why we made the base region thin? There is a physics behind that. There are some physics, there are some logics behind and also the doping of base region also less compared to emitter and collector. The doping we are using, suppose NPN transistor, base is P-type. So the doping of base is less compared to emitter and collector. So base is lightly doped. And generally the emitter region is heavily doped. Because the emitter, it indicates that it will emit the carrier. So if you have a very heavy doping, the majority carrier concentration will be higher. The emitter region is heavily doped. Collector is moderately doped and base is lightly doped. So in descending order, we can uh, list uh, that first one is emitter, then it will be collector, then it will be base for doping point of view. And for area point of view, descending order, first one will be collector, then emitter, then base. And there are two PN junction I already mentioned, the base emitter junction and base collector junction. Operating regions. So we have two base, uh, base uh, means uh, PN junction in BJT. One is base emitter junction, another one is base collector junction. So here in this picture, I just uh, represent them by using two diode because the PN junction is just like a diode. It's just a vectorial representation. Um, it is not uh, uh, strongly related to the BJT device physics. Okay, just to get the idea. See, we have three region, active region. In active region, the base emitter junction is forward bias. And the base collector junction, it is reverse bias. The base emitter junction forward bias, that means the equivalent diode is on. And the base collector junction, that is another one, PN junction, that is off. Second region is cutoff region. Both are reverse bias, both are off. So the current will be zero in cutoff region, except a small amount of leakage current. And the another one region we can say that is called saturation region. Here both junctions are forward biased. Both junctions are forward biased. So from those conditions we can say that the BJT will be on, see, when the base emitter junction is forward biased. So the BJT is on. And on means there may be two conditions. The BJT may be either in active region or in saturation region. So when the BJT is on, depending upon condition, the BJT may operate in active region or saturation region. And BJT off means the base emitter junction is reverse bias. No need to check any other thing. If the BJT, if the base emitter junction is reverse bias, simply the BJT will be off. Now depending upon the base collector junction, whether the base collector junction is forward or reverse bias, you will get active region or saturation region, depending upon the base collector junction. So we have three regions and more technically, but in some textbook, I'm mentioning otherwise you people will be confused if you see some other reference, other textbook. In some textbook, it is mentioned there are four operating regions. That is also true. Four operating region means the active region divided into two different categories. One is called forward active, another one is called reverse active. 
The region mentioned here that is called forward active, and if the region is just opposite, it is called reverse active. It is called reverse active. Three different operating region, active region, saturation. So, I'll give one. In this class, I'm going to discuss the working mechanism of a bipolar junction transistor and what are the current components present inside the BJT. That means what are the different current components are available. So BJT is a three terminal device. So emitter, base and collector. And just for this analysis, I am taking one PNP transistor. That means the emitter is a P-type. Base is n-type group and collector is p-type group. And you know that the main application area of BJT is to amplify the signal. And for amplification, the BJT must operate in active region. And the condition for active region, that is base emitter junction, that means we are talking about this junction. This junction should be forward biased and this collector junction should be reverse biased. Now, in this case, in this PNP transistor, the emitter is connected to some positive voltage and the base is connected to some negative voltage. Just check this voltage source, VB. So this voltage source makes this base emitter junction forward biased. Okay. Similarly, by connecting a voltage source DC in between base and collector, check the collector is P-type where we are applying a negative voltage with respect to base. So by applying a voltage VC, so the base collector junction is made reverse bias. That means now the BJT is in active region. Now let us investigate how the current will flow inside the BJT. Okay. Now when this base emitter junction, this junction is forward bias, you see there will be diffusion of charge carrier. So why? If the emitter is P-type group, that means in the emitter side, the holes are the majority carriers, Whereas the holes are the minority carriers in the base region because the base is n type group. And similarly, just opposite in the base region, that is n type group region, the electrons are the majority carriers here, and the same electrons are the minority carrier in the emitter region. So since there is a concentration gradient, that means in the P side there is a higher concentration of hole and inside that is the base region, there is a lower concentration of hole. So there will be some diffusion force acting on hole and the holes will diffuse from emitter to base. Okay, and when the holes will enter into the base region, okay, they became the minority carrier because uh, the pain region majority are electrons, so the hole became the minority carrier. So the hole will move from emitter to base region due to the diffusion process. In the same way, the majority carrier electrons, those are present in the base region, okay, they will move in the opposite direction, okay, and they came to the emitter region. Now it may be noted that in the previous lecture also I mentioned the base region, the area of a base very thin, smaller, and the doping concentration of base region is smaller compared to emitter and collector. So here are only few number of majority carriers that is electrons are present in the base region. Now, if we take a look on the current component, so when the holes are moving from emitter to base, uh, of course, there will be some current due to the movement of hole. That current, uh, later I'm giving one name, IPE. So IPE is the hole current in the emitter side. Okay, so IPE is the hole current E stands for emitter. Similarly, the electrons are moving from base to emitter side, so the current direction will be just opposite. Okay. So if we draw the current component, so this one will be I N E. So here I can write I N E is the electron current. So the total current that is due to the moment of electron and hole, and let the total current is I in the emitter terminal. So I can write IE equals to summation of electron current plus whole current, this one. 
And it may be noted that since uh, the value of electron current is very small because the base region having only a few electrons, it, it is a uh, light heat dose and its uh, width, its area is very small. So basically, this whole current will dominate in case of uh, PNP transistor in between the emitter and base. Okay. So this is the situation in the emitter base region. Now the holes which are injected from emitter to base region, that means here. Now there will be some recombination in the base region. Why? Because the base region having some free electrons, the majority carriers are electrons. Okay. So some of the holes will recombine with the electrons, that is free electrons available in the base region. And due to this recombination process, some of the electron hole pairs are lost. Okay. And rest of the hole will move towards the collector region. And finally, they are collected at the collector terminal. Now see, we made this uh, minus negative. This is connected to the negative potential. So rest of the holes will be attracted towards the collector terminal. And finally, they are collected here in the collector terminal. So in the collector region, so I can write one current component, ICP, so that is due to the movement of hole. Okay, the hole current in collector. So this is the value of ICP. Okay. Now check, since a few electrons are lost due to recombination in the base region, okay, and that electron will be supplied from this negative terminal of this battery because see the VB we are applying to make this base emitter junction forward bias, the electrons which are lost, okay, those free electrons are supplied from this battery. That means the battery will supply the free electrons here into the base and as a result, see the movement of electron from this uh, side to this side, as a result, there will be some base current which direction will be just opposite of the moment of electron. So the base current will flow in this direction, IB. Okay. Current and transistor we are getting that is due to the recombination in the base region. And rest of the hole will reach at the collector terminal and finally we are getting the collector terminal. So if we write the relation between this collector current and emitter current here, so just for example, if uh, 100 number of holes are entering from emitter to base region, and out of 100, five holes are lost due to recombination, the rest, that is 95 holes, are finally reached at the collector side. So the current ICP we are getting, that is due to those 95 number of holes. So mathematically, I can write, okay, so ICP, so that is, and due to that 95 number of volts, for example, that is a fraction of emitter current alpha times of IE. And alpha, of course, it is less than one because we lost some hole due to the recombination in the base region. Okay. So ICP, that is equal to alpha times of IE. So alpha is a parameter. So later we shall discuss what is alpha, how we can define alpha and all those things. Now, let's analyze some other things, other current components. Those are present inside this BJT. Till now, we analyze the current component, which are coming from the emitter side, and we analyze the recombination process that is in the base region, and we got some current in the collector side. Apart from that, there will be some leakage current in this transistor because the base collector junction is reverse biased. And from our previous discussion, we know that when a PN junction is reverse bias, there will be some small value of current that is basically due to thermally generated carriers. Due to temperature effect, some of the covalent bonds are broken. So few electron hole pairs are available inside the structure. And due to applied bias voltage, those free electrons and holes will move according to the polarity of the voltage we are applying. And as a result, uh, a very small amount of current will flow in the circuit. That is basically the reverse current, or we can say that leakage current of the device. So let's investigate in the transistor, what will be the value of those leakage current. 
Now see one thing, the base collector junction is made reverse bias, this one. So we are going to analyze the leakage current component that is in between the base and collector region. It's to analyze the leakage current, the first thing is that since we are focusing on the base collector junction, so we are not paying attention to the emitter, base junction. So emitter region, base region, collector region. That means the emitter base junction, the, the voltage we are applying here, okay, so that now in this case it is open because we are interested to find out the current component between the base and collector junction here. So this one is our N region, P region, and uh, sorry, P region, PNP transistor. Okay. And this junction is reverse bias, that means this. This. Now, due to temperature effect, I'll let uh, some electron hole uh, pairs are available here. Okay some free electrons and holes are available. So of course the holes will move towards the negative potential. The holes will move towards this potential because uh, here we apply that negative voltage and the electrons will move towards this side. That means the movement of electron will be towards this. So as a result, we are getting some current due to the movement of this uh, thermally generated electron and hole and the direction of current will be from this towards this because the hole will move in this direction and the electrons are moving from this side to this side. As a result, the current due to electron, you will get just opposite. So the current will flow from base to collector for PNP transistor and it's just opposite for NPN transistor, okay. So this current, we are uh, giving one name ICO, okay. So ICO is the leakage current in the structure when the collector base junction is reverse bias. So it is having two component, ICO of N plus ICO of P. So ICO of N, that is the contribution due to the electron and ICO P, that is the contribution of leakage current due to the hole. Okay, this is. Now adding all the components. So in a previous diagram, we have seen that we have one current component that is coming from emitter and base, that is ICP. Okay. So this this current, let's draw here. This current is ICP. And we have another one current component ICO. So if I Mention this one is collector current IC. And if I apply KCL at this point, or simply you can write that the collector current will be summation of this ICP and ICO. So basically, this part, second part is the leakage current component, and first part is the current which we are getting due to the holes which finally collected in the collector terminal after recombination. Now previously I already mentioned this, I can uh, write this in form of alpha times of IE. So IC that is equal to ICP that is alpha times of IE plus ICO. So basically this is the relation between the collector current and emitter current and also the leakage current. So this is the current equation of BJT. And another one interesting thing you can check. So this is our collector current IC. Now if, if you take a look on the collector emitter and base terminal, and if I apply KCL, see the incoming current is IE, and the outgoing part is base current IB, and collector current IC. So emitter current is equal to base current plus collector current. This is the relation between the three terminal currents of a BJT. The emitter current is nothing but summation of base current and collector current. Okay. 
with the base current is due to recombination we lost a few holes due to recombination and rest of the holes finally are collected in the collector terminal so of course the current ie will be equal to ic plus ip so i think it's clear now we can further simplify this one so now using the equation So we have IC equals to alpha I plus of ICO. And we have the relation between different current component I equal to IC plus IB. Now from this equation, I can write IC equal to IE. Here, I can replace IE by using this, IC plus IB. I'm going to put the value of IE here. That is alpha times of IC plus IB plus ICO. And if I take IC common, one minus alpha, that is alpha times of IB plus ICO. So the relation we got IC equal to alpha by one minus alpha into IB plus ICO by one minus alpha. Now the factor alpha by one minus alpha is represented by using another one constant that is called beta. So then this one by one minus alpha to so here this part. So one by one minus alpha will be beta plus one. So the final current expression we got in a different form IC equals to beta IB plus beta plus one ICU. So this is another one current expression in a different form. So this is one equation and after replacing all those values we got this is another one equation. Now from this equation we can write just see since the value of leakage current is small compared to other part, so neglecting the ICO here, we can just write alpha equals to IC by IE. And here in this equation, the beta equals to IC by IB, neglecting leakage current ICO. So basically alpha and beta both are ratio of two currents, so they are basically current gain. Alpha and beta, they are current gain. Now let us see how we can define the alpha and beta and what will be the typical value for alpha and beta. So alpha equal to IC by IE. So now if we take a look on the common base mode, so the base is common, emitter is the input, collector is the output. So just take Now here, the alpha equal to IC by IE, and this is the common base mode of BJT. The base is common between the emitter and collector configuration. So of course, the emitter is the input current and collector current is the output current. So IC by IE, so that define the common base mode current gain, and the value of alpha is less than one because the emitter current value is always greater than the collector current value. And the typical range of alpha is generally 0 0.95 to 0 0.99 for a BJT. Similarly, beta equal to IC by IB. And of course, the value of IB is very small, generally in microampere range compared to IC. So beta is greater than one. And and generally, the typical value of beta for a BJT is within 50 to 200 in that range. And how we can define beta, just take in the common emitter mode. So this is the C mode of BJT, common emitter, where emitter is common in between base and collector. IB is the input current, IC is the output current. So IC by IB, they define the common emitter mode current gain. And another one parameter we may introduce, that is called gamma. 
So gamma is the emitter current by base current IE by IB. So, so in this section, I'm going to discuss the transistor current components in a more physical way by using that diode current equation. So as you know that inside the BJT, whatever the current is flowing, that is passing through some PN junction. That is the base emitter junction and base collector junction. So we can express the current components, that is the emitter current, collector current, and uh, the base current by using the diode current equation also. So till now, in our previous analysis, when we derive the different transistor current component and we establish the relation between alpha, beta, et cetera, we consider that the base emitter junction is forward bias and base collector junction is reverse bias. But in saturation region, the fact is that the base collector junction is also forward bias and some finite amount of current will be added with that. So we are going to explore all those things in detail. So diode current equation can be established by using uh, that diffusion current equation. So that is in brief, we can write the diffusion current equation. So here I'm considering the hole only and we are considering that PNP transistor. So we are focusing on the whole current. So JP, that is equal to minus Q into DP into DP by DX. So where that dp is the diffusion constant and that dp by dx or del p by del x is the concentration gradient for whole. So now this derivative dp by dx can be solved by solving a differential equation using the minority carrier injection effect. Okay, so that is dp by dx, that is equal to p dash x, which is a function of distance, of course. So that is equal to p dash zero into e to the power minus x by lp. Okay. So it clearly indicates that, uh, that uh, concentration gradient decreases with the distance. And here the parameter LP, that is the diffusion length. Okay, so LP equal to root of DP into tau P. Okay, where DP is the diffusion constant and tau P is the uh, whole lifetime. And LP, that is equal to the diffusion length. This one. So now putting this value dp by dx in the diffusion current expression, so and after simplification, we'll get this. Yeah, another one thing that uh, p dash x, this one, this can also be represented as p dash x equal to p dash zero, that is basically p dash zero means that uh, what is the uh, initial hole concentration, the maximum hole concentration, that is basically P at position X equal to zero minus equilibrium hole concentration P zero, okay, into E to the power minus X by LP. So if we put all those things into the diffusion current expression, so finally we are getting JP equal to Q DP by LP into P zero minus equilibrium hole concentration okay, into e to the power minus x by lb. So jp is nothing but 
diffusion current density or hole okay now the current ip that is nothing but area into jp so that is a that is a stands for area q dp by lp into other parameters this one now at junction that means at x equal to 0 if we put x equal to 0 that uh, ip will be equal to a q dp by lp into p of 0 minus p 0 so because this term will be 1 so this is the basic diffusion current expression we are getting at x equal to 0. Now, this P0, it is a function of the bias. That means when a junction is a forward bias, okay. So more number of carrier injection will take space. So it varies exponentially. So P0 equal to basically this one into e to the power v by vt, where vt is the thermal voltage that is equal to kt by q, that is equal to 0 0.0259 volt at room temperature 300 Kelvin. So finally, putting all those values, we are getting IP zero that is at x equal to zero a q dp by lp into p zero into p zero and see we can take p0 common here so it will be e to the power v by vt minus one okay it may be noted that when you derive the diode current expression in any semiconductor the total current is basically current due to drift and current due to diffusion process but wherever in a pn junction diode and the same thing happens for transistor in low level injection process that value of drift current is very small and insignificant compared to the diffusion current so that's why the total current is basically dominated by the diffusion current now going to the next part now we are going to establish a large signal model of bjt that means basically the diode connected models or uh, the popular name of this model is basically the ebers mole model. So this model captures the biasing of different uh, junctions, that is base emitter junction and base collector junction. Even if the base collector junction is forward bias, it will also consider the effect of that. So let us see that thing. So when uh, now coming to the base emitter junction, okay, so uh, that current, uh, when the base emitter junction is forward bias. So then, so we can uh, that represent the current IE1 that is equal to IES into e to the power 
the forward bias voltage Ve by Vt minus one. So just see this equation is nothing but the diode current equation. And this part IES that can be derived by using the diffusion current equation. That means basically this part, okay, this part. That depends upon the area of a junction, that uh, concentration gradient, okay, etc. all those things. So since IE1 uh, is this one, so the same component in the collector side, so we can write IC1 will be equal to alpha times of IE1. Now here, instead of writing alpha, I'm writing one uh, factor alpha F, that is alpha forward, because here in Eversmore model, uh, we have two types of alpha, one is alpha F, another one is alpha R, so reverse alpha and forward alpha. So IC1 will be alpha times of IE1, that is alpha F IES into uh, e to the power VEB by VT minus one, this one. So this is the situation, uh, this is the forward component basically, okay. That means if I draw the diagram, it looks like this one, Let, uh, this is our emitter terminal and so here we have a diode which is connected between the emitter and base uh, let this is the base terminal okay so due to the forward biasing of this diode we got this ie1 and as a result and the collector side we are getting similar type of component that is basically a dependent source okay the collector so this is basically alpha f i1 this is now when the base collector junction is a forward bias that may happen because uh, you know that about bjt uh, that uh, the region may be active region may be saturation region for active region base collector junction is a reverse bias so uh, that uh, the leakage current will be there it's the, uh, okay so the in the reverse direction that is from collector to base there is no current component except leakage current okay. but when the collector base junction forward bias okay so then some finite amount of current will flow in between the collector and base terminal. Okay, so that current we can write in this way. Okay, so basically, so we can model in, in that case when the collector base junction is forward bias. Okay, so we can again model that junction as a diode. Okay, this one. And similarly, so its effect at the emitter side, it, it is modeled by current source. So that means we can say basically if I interchange the position of emitter and collector, so what will be the effect? Okay, so it's similar to that. Okay, this. So this one is nothing but alpha R into IC1. Okay, if the current flowing through this is IC1, this diode, so in the emitter side, its effect will be alpha R into IC1, okay, this current. Okay. So if I mention that in form of equation, okay, so in the when collector junction is forward biased, then we may write that IC1, okay, IC1 equal to minus of ICS. I just put one in the minus sign because the current is going in the opposite direction into e to the power, the voltage across junction, that is VCB by VT, okay, minus one, okay. And this equivalent component, okay, I am putting this R, that is the reverse, okay. So that is basically alpha R, into IC1, okay, so this part we are getting. Now adding all those things, if you apply the KCL here at the emitter terminal and collector terminal and base terminal, you will get the current relation between all the current components. Suppose here, let the incoming current is IE, okay, here, and this is also one incoming part, alpha R into IC1, 
and outgoing current is this part. So from there, we can write what will be the expression for this one. And similarly, the collector side, this current is IC, which is, uh, this is outgoing part, through incoming part, uh, this one, and outgoing part, this one. So from there, we can write, we can uh, find out a relation between the, uh, the different terminal current, emitter current, base current, and collector current. The same thing is true for base current. So base current, as you know, that the base current IB is nothing but emitter current minus collector current. So from that, we can calculate what will be the value of base current. And this model is a popular model that is commonly known as the Ebersmol model. Okay, so this is basically a diode model, diode connected model. Okay, so this model captures that uh, the effect of uh, that uh, base collector junction reverse biasing and the forward biased base collector junction. Okay, and we have two current gain here, alpha F and alpha R. Alpha F that is that is the same as your common alpha, that is the forward alpha, and alpha R that is the reverse. Alpha. So that's all about this ever small model. So let us solve some problem from that BJT chapter. So in this problem statement, the uniformly doped silicon NPN bipolar transistor is to be biased in the forward active mode with base collector junction reverse bias voltage by three volt. The transistor doping are the emitter doping 10 to the power 17 per cubic centimeter, base doping 10 to the power 16 per cubic centimeter, and the collector doping is 10 to the power 15 per cubic centimeter. Now find the base emitter voltage at which the minority carrier concentration, that is the electron concentration at junction that is x equal to zero, is 10 percent of the majority carrier hole concentration. So. First of all, see, so the base doping NB equal to 10 to the power 16 per cubic centimeter. And uh, we are working with the silicon BJT. So intrinsic carrier concentration, NI equal to 1.5 into 10 to the power 10 per cubic centimeter at room temperature. We assume that the problem statement is for room temperature. So we assume NI equal to this. Okay. So first we have to find out that minority carrier concentration. So minority carrier concentration in equilibrium. That means under no bias condition. Okay, so N zero, that is N I square by N B, that is 1.5, into 10 to the power 10 square by a 10 to the power 16. So just calculate that part. And I think it will be around 2.25 into 10 to the power four per cubic centimeter. So this is the minority carrier electron concentration in equilibrium. Okay. Now we know that uh, that how that uh, carrier concentration varies okay, with that uh, bias voltage. Okay. So in a previous theory, we also discussed that part. Okay. So the carrier concentration at x equal to zero, that is n zero. Okay under equilibrium, under non-equilibrium, okay. So in non-equilibrium, that means when we are applying the bias voltage, A not x equal to zero, that is N zero into exponential, okay. So that is E to the power V by Vt, okay, where Vt is the thermal voltage. V means the junction voltage we are applying VBE by VT. Okay, this one. Okay. So from there we can uh, calculate what is the value of VBE. So we can take a logarithm, okay, and we may write, and you know that VT equal to 25.9 millivolt, that is 26 millivolt. 
So we can write VB is equal to VT ln VT ln N0 by equilibrium value. Okay. N at position x equal to 0 by its equilibrium value. This one. While VT equal to 0 0.0259 volt at T equal to 300 Kelvin. Okay. Yes. Now see the problem statement. We have to calculate the value of base emitter voltage, that means VVE, where that carrier minority carrier electron concentration at x equal to 0, 10 percent of the majority carrier hole concentration. So 10 percent of the majority carrier hole concentration. That means that n at x equal to 0, okay, let's move to the next one. Uh, so at x equal to 0, okay, if minority carrier concentration equal to 10% of NB, that is the majority carrier concentration, then N at x equal to 0 is 10% of NB, that is 10 to the power 15 per cubic centimeter, because the NB value, how much NB is equal to 10 to the power 16 per cubic centimeter. So we can just put this value. So VVE, now we can calculate VVE, that is VT ln, okay, this, see the term, N at x equal to zero, that is 10 to the power 15, divided by the equilibrium value N0, which we derive from the mass action law. This is 2.25 into 10 to the power four. So 2.25 into 10 to the power four. So this will give the result around 0 0.636 volt. So this is the required value of VV where your minority carrier concentration near junction will be 10% of the majority carrier concentration. That's the base dope. Okay. Now for the next problem, see the parameters in the base region of an NPN bipolar transistor are as follows. So that means for an NPN transistor, the parameters of base region is given, that's Tn, that is the diffusion constant, okay of minority carrier, that is we are working with NPN transistor, so base region, okay, so the minority carriers will be electrons. It's 20 centimeters square per second. NB0, that is 10 to the power four per cubic centimeter. The XB, okay, that is one micron. And area of a base region, that is 10 to the power four per centimeter square. Now find the collector current IC, if the base emitter voltage Gb is equal to 0.5 volt. Okay. So for this problem statement, so first we have to go to the uh, equivalent diode current equation. Okay, that's the collector current. Okay, so IC. Okay. So the diode equivalent current equation IC equal to IS into e to the power k okay. EB by VT or more specifically you can write e to the power VB by VT minus one also no problem okay so now this parameter IS so that will come from the diffusion equation so that is Q into dn into area divided by the diffusion length, which is here is limited to xb. Okay, that means uh, we assume that that uh, total width of the base region is uh, that is equal to the diffusion length and that carrier concentration into nb0. Okay. So if you calculate 
this will give around 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 14 and here. Now we have to find the value of uh, IC. So you just put this value here. So then IC will be equal to 3.2 into 10 to the power minus 14 into e to the power VB 0 0.5 by VT 0 0.0259. So this will be the value of collector current that is around 7.74 micro ampere. This is In this tutorial, I'm going to discuss the basics of MOS transistor, its structure and operation, its threshold voltage, the effect of substrate bias voltage on the threshold voltage of MOS transistor, then the current voltage characteristics of MOSFET and different operating regions, that is the ohmic region, saturation region, etc. So as you know that the MOS transistor is one important building block for modern integrated circuits. So whenever we are going to design an integrated circuit, so basically internally the components are basically designed using the MOS transistors. So this is because by using MOS transistors, uh, there are some certain advantages compared to bipolar junction transistor the MOS transistor occupies less silicon area. It is having higher input resistance. And the process steps, that is the fabrication steps required to design one MOS transistor is quite less compared to a bipolar junction transistor. Apart from that, BJT having some other problems, okay, such as uh, the BJT is basically the bipolar devices, both electron and holes are responsible for current conduction. And uh, due to that minority carrier transport, the switching characteristics of BJT is uh, not good. So it cannot be used for high frequency switching. Whereas the MOSFET, since it belongs to the majority carrier devices, either electron or hole is responsible for current conduction. So MOSFET can be used uh, to design a high frequency switch. Now coming to the structure of MOS transistor. So the MOS stands for metal oxide semiconductor. So basically the it's MOS that is nothing but M stands for metal, O stands for oxide, and S stands for semiconductor. Okay. Now if you look at the gate region of any MOS transistor, See, at the top, there is a metal layer. So that is uh, the gate region, this one. Then below that, there is a dielectric layer. So generally the silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, or uh, nowadays different high permittivity dielectric such as hafnium dioxide is also used as a gate dielectric. And below that, we have the silicon substrate. Okay. So this total structure forms a MOS capacitor. So you can see it forms a parallel plate capacitor. So at the top, there is a gate. Okay, you can see it is one charge plate. The bottom, it's a p-type, it's a substrate, the silicon substrate, semiconductor region, this one. And in between two charge plates, there is a dielectric, so it behaves like a parallel plate capacitor. So this region is basically the heart of any MOS transistor. The operation of MOS plate entirely depends upon the characteristics or the physics of this region. Apart from that, in the um, see there are two other contacts that is drain and source, okay. And the region is marked as N plus. So basically this MOSFET is uh, N, N channel MOSFET, N MOS or N channel MOSFET, and it is enhancement type. It is enhancement type. 
Okay, the n plus the purpose of using this n plus is to form the ohmic contact because you know the metal contacts, those are connections, the interconnects are metal lines, those, those are metal lines. So whenever a metal touch the semiconductor, it forms a semiconductor metal junction or short key junction. And there is the chance of uh, formation of a potential barrier and some unwanted unnecessary voltage drop takes place, which is not desirable at all. Okay. To avoid that, to prevent the formation of short key contact, here the contact region, that is the source and drain region, are heavily to show that the ohmic contact is formed and uh, there will not be any such type of uh, potential barrier formation which occurs in short key contact. Okay. Now coming to the operation, so how it works. So before discussing the operation of MOSFETs, so let us explore the different types of MOSFETs. So, so the, uh, depending upon the operation, so there are two different types of MOSFET. Number one is enhancement type, and number two is this is called depletion type. The basic difference between enhancement and depletion type is the enhancement type devices are basically normally off device. That means if you see this structure, when you are applying some gate voltage, suppose here, if you apply some positive gate voltage, then that minority carrier, because the substrate is P-type doped, okay, it's a P-type doped substrate, P-type silicon, the minority carrier electrons will be deposited here, okay, and they will form one conducting channel. And a connection is established between the source and drain. Now, if you apply some voltage here at the drain terminal with respect to source, let source is grounded. Since the conducting layer is present, which is basically the electron, and now the current will flow. So until and unless the channel is formed, so there will be no current in the structure, in the device, except the leakage current, which occurs due to the temperature effect. So in the absence of gate voltage, since there is no channel, so of course there will be no current. So that's why this type of device is called the normally off device. And when you are increasing the magnitude of gate voltage, so more number of minority carrier static electrons will be deposited. And since more number of free carriers are available for current conduction, of course, the current will increase. So when the gate voltage value increases, the current increases. So this is basically the working mechanism of enhancement type device. On the other hand, for depletion type device, this channel is already inbuilt. So by using the ion implantation technique, some channel, uh, some lightly doped channel region is already formed. Okay, so the n-type doped region is already formed here. And since uh, the free electrons are already available, because since this region is n-type doped, so majority carriers are electrons in this region and the channel is already available. So whenever you are applying any voltage in between drain and source, there will be some current, even when the gate voltage is zero. So that type of device is a depletion type device. And uh, in this case, so we can say it is a depletion type MOSFET. One simple example of depletion type device is a JFET or junction FET, okay. So now let's explore the operation of uh, enhancement type device. And remember that in case of IC design, in maximum cases, in most of the field, the enhancement type device is used. So talking about the digital logic circuit, different uh, digital uh, integrated circuits where the operation is basically based upon the switching means you know that uh, the digital logic means it is just like a one and zero okay so the switching whether the transistor is on or off so for this type of operation of course we want that enhancement type of device and not a depletion type a depletion type device having some uh, few application areas maybe uh, as an active uh, load etc inside the ic okay So now coming to the operation. So whenever you are applying some positive gate voltage here, so the electrons, the minority carrier electrons will be attracted and they will form one channel. Okay. Now note that the substrate is P-type doped, it's a P-type silicon, where majority carriers are holes, but the channel is formed by the minority carriers. So here we can uh, uh, define, uh, we can correlate this charge that uh, that amount of charge is available here. So we can give one name. So this is called the inversion layer. 
the name of the channel is called inversion there okay and we can define one boundary voltage so that is called the threshold voltage so i will discuss it later the threshold voltage is basically the minimum amount of voltage required to create the conducting layer to create the channel or to start the current flow this is just a rough definition okay so actually the definition is it is the minimum amount of gate voltage required to achieve the strong inversion okay there are certain condition uh, by satisfying those condition we can say the device is in strong inversion okay. so we can say the threshold voltage is a boundary between the off state and on state of a mos device so if i write a little simplified uh, description of this uh, charge that is the q inversion that is the amount of charge present in the inversion layer so that is basically you know q equal to c into v okay so here c means it is a cox and v means here basically the amount of gate voltage you are applying vgs with respect to source minus the threshold voltage of the device vth minus i'm adding another one term v of x okay so let me tell what is v of x so v of x is the voltage at any point okay so the v of x this component will come when you are applying some drain voltage with respect to source okay let source is grounded a drain we are applying some value vds so we can say the v of x equal to vds at drain end let uh, i am defining this uh, this point is x equal to 0 and this point is x equal to l so that the channel length the length of the channel is l starting from x equal to 0 point this one up to this x equal to l so v of x is vds at x equal to l and v of x is equal to 0 at x equal to 0 so this is the simplified expression for the charge present here so you can easily estimate when you are increasing the value of VDA. So that means, uh, see, and since uh, the value of uh, V of X is around VDS near the drain terminal, and when you are moving from drain terminal towards source terminal, okay, so this V of X value will fall. When you are moving from drain terminal towards source terminal, the V of X value will decreases, and as a result, the value of Q inversion will increase. So this indicates that the shape of the channel okay, for non-zero VDS will be like this. It is something like the trapezoidal. It is not uniformly distributed. The shape of the inversion layer for a MOS transistor, okay, when you are applying a non-zero VDS, it is something like trapezoidal in nature, where less amount of inversion charge is present towards the drain terminal and more amount of charge is present towards source terminal following this equation and when the vds is absent that means the drain and source uh, we are not applying any voltage then this term this component will not come and then the shape of the inversion layer is just a uniform in nature it will be as like a simple capacitor this is So one thing is clear that whenever you are in, we are increasing the value of gate voltage VGS, the amount of Q will increase. So it uh, clearly indicates it's an enhancement type device. And uh, this COX, COX is basically the capacitors per unit area. So COX is basically epsilon OX into epsilon zero by TOX. So this is uh, basically the oxide capacitance per unit area and if we consider the full geometry then of course um, it will be multiplied by the width of the device it will be w into c in that okay now coming to the next part so Another thing is clear that when I'm applying some gate voltage, which is positive and which is uh, greater than the threshold voltage, see the equation once again, which is greater than the threshold voltage, some finite value of Q inversion will be there in the channel and the channel shape is trapezoidal in nature. Okay. 
But if the value of gate voltage is less than threshold voltage, that means when of VGS is less than VTH, so this region is basically called the sub-threshold region. So we can simply say that the MOS transistor is off where a small amount of leakage current will flow. That, of course, depends upon the geometry and some other factors. And when VGS greater than VTH, then you can say the MOS transistor is in inversion region or strong inversion region. The MOS rate is in strong inversion region. So those are two conditions. So one, one condition we can say it is the op state, the sub threshold, if we consider the digital logic, and this one is in the on state of the device. So the boundary is basically defined by the VTH. So before exploring the internal details, just a, a little bit uh, more things are required. Okay. Now see the gate region is a metal region. And uh, here the substrate region is semiconductor region. Now, if you calculate the work function, so there is a work function difference between the gate and the substrate. Because you know the gate metal, suppose you are using aluminum, it is having a different work function. And the substrate is a p-type silicon, it is p-type doped, it is having some other values of work function. So due to this work function difference, some built-in voltage drop takes place inside the MOS system. So that uh, if you draw the band diagram, energy band diagram or conduction band profile, okay, so uh, at flat band condition, it should look like this one. So uh, just, just a rough sketch. So this is the valence band, this is the Fermi label, and uh, later uh, this is the conduction band. So this is the metal region, this is the oxide region, and this is the p-type silicon region. Okay. So this is the band diagram roughly, <clears throat> just a rough sketch at the flat band condition, but due to this work function difference, what will happen, so some bending will take place some voltage drop will take place inside the MOS system and the potential means uh, you can say that uh, that uh, little bit bending of energy band diagram will take place that when the instead of like this the band diagram will look like this one it's just shaped in the yellow color uh, this one it's uh, the conduction band will bend a little bit here okay and Actually, the valence band uh, should be near a uh, Fermi level uh, because it is p-type doped. The EV should be here for flat band condition. And when the bending will take space, it will bend like this little bit downward direction. And as a result, if we draw the intrinsic level EI, it will also bend in the downward direction. So there is a little bit downward bending is there due to the built-in voltage drop and the voltage drop occurs due to the mismatch in the work function between the gate and the substrate region. And you can compensate this amount of bending and again you can restore the band diagram to the flat band that means exactly on the straight line shown in the green color by applying some external voltage between the gate and the body terminal. So by applying external voltage, it is possible to compensate the band bending. And that voltage is called the flat band voltage. Flat band voltage or VAV. So it is the external voltage that needs to be applied between the gate and the body terminal of the MOS transistor to make the band diagram absolutely flat or to compensate the bending of band diagram which occurs due to the what function difference between the gate and the substrate region. Okay. Now coming to the threshold voltage. So as you know that the threshold voltage is basically a boundary between the off state and on state. So if we explore the different components of threshold voltage uh, in a brief, 
So basically the threshold voltage having a few components. So I'm just writing brief. The first component is, so basically you know the threshold voltage is the summation of all the components, okay, that uh, all the gate voltage components. The first is the flat band voltage. That means the amount of voltage you have to apply externally to compensate the band bending, or uh, basically it is nothing but the work function difference between gate and the channel. Okay. So we can give one name, phi n is the metal and semiconductor region. Second component of threshold voltage is the amount of gate voltage required to establish strong inversion. Okay, that means here phi s will be equal to minus of phi s. Okay the change in surface potential will be exactly equal to minus of phi s. That means it, it means that this bending, okay. So here, this bending, the amount of bending here, see in that since it is a p-type semiconductor, the Fermi level is below intrinsic level. But near surface, the inversion means the semiconductor is just behaves like n-type, okay. So the amount of gate voltage required to bend the band diagram in such a way this bending will be like this. That means this distance will be equal to this distance. That means phi s will be equal to minus phi s or the total bending from this to this. We can say this one will be minus of two phi f. When this total bending is equal to minus of two phi f, so then we can say the strong inversion condition is achieved. So the threshold voltage is that voltage okay, where the MOS satisfies the strong inversion condition, that is the total change in surface potential equal to minus two phi f. Another one component we may add, the amount of gate voltage component required to offset depletion charges. Now, one thing is clear, you see, whenever you are applying some gate voltage here, so let here if you are applying some positive gate voltage, okay. Oh, just a minute. So when you are applying some positive gate voltage, so first of all, the amount of the majority carriers, that means here in this structure, we are talking about that, uh, this is a p-type silicon substrate. The holes are the majority carriers. So when you are applying a positive gate voltage, first holes are rippled back into the substrate here, like this. The holes are rippled back into the substrate and the minority carrier electrons are deposited. So holes are rippled back into the substrate and minority carrier electrons are deposited near this. So when the holes are rippled back into the substrate, they left some fixed ions. Okay? And the depletion layer is created near this. Okay. So here in the channel region, there exist two types of charge carrier. One is the fixed ions or immobile ions, that is basically the depletion charges. And second one is the free carriers, that is the inversion layer charges, that is basically the electron. Okay. And they are basically minority carriers. So those are three basic components of special voltage and we may add another one component, okay, so which is uh, not so much important, which contribution is very less, so we may ignore in some cases. So summing up all those components, so let uh, this one, uh, this uh, this is uh, let QB is uh, that uh, QB zero is the total amount of depletion charge. So the uh, we want some voltage that uh, the amount of voltage that is V equal to Q by C. Okay, so we have to apply this equivalent opposite amount of voltage to offset the depletion charges. Summing all those components, so we got 
VT0. So VT0 is basically the zero bias threshold voltage equal to phi ms minus of 2 phi f minus of QB0 by COX. So this is the simplified expression of VT0, where VT0 is called the zero bias threshold voltage. Okay. That means the source and body, they are at same potential, VSP equal to zero. Okay. Now let me just write the basic equation related to this. Okay. So phi f that is called the Fermi potential, it is nothing but the kT by Q ln Ni by Na. Okay. And QB0, the depletion layer charge, it is minus root of 2QNA epsilon SI minus 2 phi F. Okay. So you can derive that by using uh, that Poisson's equation and basic fundamental semiconductor device. So here I'm not going to derive that part. And COX, you know the side capacitance per unit area. Now consider a situation where that source and body are a different potential. So then this, this QB0, that means when V is B not equal to zero, then QB, instead of writing QB0, it will be actually QB. And the equation will be almost in the same form, 2QNA epsilon SI, it will be just minus 2 phi A plus VSB term will be added here, this. And in that case, the threshold voltage is basically termed as VT or VTH, not VT0. So we can say VT will be equal to VT0 at VSB equal to zero. Okay. And the relation between VT and VT0 is uh, written as the VT equal to VT0 plus gamma into root over minus of 2 phi A plus VSB minus of root over minus of 2 phi f. It's a mod value we have to take because uh, otherwise it will be imaginary number, okay. So this is the relation between the VT and VT0 and you can see when VSB equal to zero, the second term will be canceled and VT will be equal to VT0. Okay. So this VT is nothing but the threshold voltage, the same. Sometimes we denote it as a VTH also. Okay. And the factor gamma is called the body factor. So that is basically root of 2QANA epsilon SI by COX and NA is the acceptor concentration and epsilon SI equal to that 11.7 uh, epsilon zero, that is the permittivity of silicon. So, those are the detailed discussion regarding the threshold voltage and its component. So let's just check one thing that at the, when we are increasing the value of VSB, the VT, VT will also increase. It's just if I plot them in a graph, so let X axis, this is the VSB and Y axis, that is the threshold voltage. Okay. So when the value of VSB increases, okay, the value of VT will also increase. Uh, later it will follow almost uh, in this way. Okay, uh, not like that exactly, it's the opposite exponents here. Okay, so it will increase in that way. Okay, and this bottom one is just uh, the value, it will be Vt zero in here. When Vsb zero, the value will be Vt zero, this value. This value is Vt0, this one. So the graph looks like this one. It's a little bit exponential in nature, like this. Okay. Now coming to the current voltage characteristics. 
So to define the current voltage, so we may write the simplified expression, the charge which is responsible for current conduction, that is W times, that is multiplied by W, QW into CUX into VGS minus of the threshold voltage, VTH minus of the channel potential, VX. So as you, you can see that whenever we are increasing the value of gate voltage, VGS, the Q inversion will increase. So if we plot the ID VGS characteristics, and yeah, of course, when the Q inversion increases, the current will increase. So if we plot the transfer characteristics, you know the ID VGS characteristics. So the graph looks like this. So the, roughly this is the VTH. Okay, so below VTH, here actually this equation is not valid actually for below VTH. There's a very basic simple equation coming from the Q equal to C relation. Anyway, so below VTH current is negligible, the leakage current will be there. And above VTH, uh, that current will increase exponentially. But the current in a MOSFET, we can derive it by using some approximation. The actual process is very difficult, but by applying certain approximation, we can derive it. Okay. The approximation we are taking that is called the gradual channel approximation. So here in the gradual channel approximation, that inside the device, so let's say here we have this direction we are considering the X and this direction we are considering the Y. So while performing the gradual channel approximation, when we are applying the Poisson equation, so instead of applying a 2D Poisson equation, we are applying the 1D Poisson equation. Okay. So here the variation of electric field along X direction, that means DE by DX, so in this approximation, instead of taking the two-dimensional nature of the electric field, we are considering only one-dimensional nature of the electric field. And this approximation is valid when the variation of electric field along X direction is negligible compared to the variation of electric field along Y direction. And using this gradual channel approximation, so we can write I is basically this ID, that is the drain current equation, that is basically mu into COX into W by L into VGS minus VTH to VDS minus of VDS square by two. Now this equation is actually valid in the linear region, the ohmic region, up to the value of VDS, which is less than VGS minus of VTH. So this is the boundary. So this is valid up to this. So when VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus VTH, this above equation is not valid and the MOS is in saturation region. As you know that in the saturation region, the drain current of MOS state is almost constant, but this equation unable to model that effect. So only this equation is valid for linear regions better to give one name IG lin. We can derive the saturation region current expression from the linear region just by putting VDS equal to VGS minus VTH into this above expression, and we got ID sat equal to half of mu COX W by L into VGS minus VTH square. So this is the equation related to the saturation region current expression. Whenever you are going to solve any numerical from MOS transistor, you first check the boundary, whether the MOS is in a cutoff region, saturation or linear region. So if this condition is satisfied, the MOS is in linear region, otherwise in a saturation region. So for saturation region, you have to use this current expression. And for linear region of operation, you have to use this current expression. Even the saturation region current expression, 
whatever the equation we are getting, that, that is not uh, actual perfect one. Because if you see the IV characteristics of a MOSFET, it's a VDS and ID. So as you know, that basic characteristics looks like this. Okay. If you see the drain current here, that uh, in the saturation region, it is not actually constant. It, in, it increases slightly with VDS. Okay. But see the equation, there is no VDS term in this equation. So there is no VDS term means it is absolutely constant, but it, it should be a function of VDS. Okay. So this is basically the drain current, which is not constant actually, slowly increases, slightly increases with the drain voltage, VDS. So that is uh, due to an effect that is called the channel length modulation effect. Okay. So just I'm drawing this graph separately. It's a VDS. This is ID. So whatever the current equation we got, we are getting like this for uh, any value of VGS. So VGS equal to some um, later uh, 1.5 volt, for example. Okay. So this region up to this region, we can say this is the linear or ohmic region, and this region we are saying it is the saturation region okay. but in the saturation region c this current actually is not constant it slightly increases with the value of vds okay so that is due to one effect it's called the channel length modulation effect okay this so including channel length modulation effect that uh, we can add one extra term in the id set current expression half of mu c u x w by l into VGS minus VTH square into one extra factor is added with that one plus lambda times of VDS. Okay. So the second parameter one plus lambda VDS accounts for the VDS dependency of ID. See the VDS, the ID, the drain current saturation region is a function of VDS, it's a weak function. It's a lambda is basically one. Uh, factor is called channel length modulation factor okay. and it's empirical constant it does not have any physical significance and uh, this value may be different for a different MOS transistor for a short channel device the value of lambda will be higher compared to the long channel device because in short channel devices the channel length modulation effect is quite prominent compared to the long channel device. So if you consider a very long channel device, the current in saturation region is almost constant. And if the channel length is getting reduced, that the channel length um, the current will not be constant and it will increase slowly with the previous and saturation region. And the boundary between the linear and saturation region, we can roughly draw one boundary. So that is basically PD set that is equal to VGS minus of VTH. So this is the boundary between the linear region and saturation region. So that's all about the basic current voltage characteristics of a MOSFET. So to solve any numerical uh, from a MOS transistor, first thing is that you have to identify the operating region, whether the MOSFET is in a linear region or saturation region. And depending upon that, you have to apply. If the value of uh, lambda is not given or if the channel length modulation factor is neglected, then, then you can apply this equation. And if the value of uh, channel length modulation factor lambda is mentioned or you have to consider that, then this is the most appropriate equation in saturation region. And in linear region, there is no such channel length modulation coping factor or phenomena. So in linear region, you can use this equation. <coughs> And I um, think you know that mu, that is nothing but the mobility. So this term is nothing but the mobility. And W is the width, L is the length of the channel, as you know that. So that's all from the basics of a MOS transistor, its current voltage characteristics, the threshold voltage, substrate bias effect, etc. Thank you. Now we are going to solve some numerical from the MOSFET chapter. Let's for this problem statement, two MOS transistor M1 and M2, they are connected in series. 
and their gate and drain terminal connected together that's shown in the figure so as you can see that drain and gate terminal of the MOS transistor connected together so this is the drain terminal just a minute the drain terminal and the gate terminal this is the source terminal again this is the drain this is gate and this is source and both are in MOS transistor because in the source the arrow is in the outward direction and the supply voltage of 5 volt is applied and uh, as part of the data the kn dash the kn dash basically you no know, kn dash equal to mu into cox this value 30 microampere per volt square and the w by ratio for both transistor is same that is equal to 40 and the threshold voltage of both the transistors are same that is equal to 0 0.8 volt so both are identical MOSFET. So we have to find out the V0 value. Okay. Now you know that when the gate and drain terminal of a MOSFET connected together, so then VDS is same as VGS because the drain and gate connected together. So gate to source voltage that is the same as drain to source voltage. And the condition for saturation region for MOS transistor, okay. So if it satisfy the condition VDS greater than equal to VGS minus VTN, then the MOSFET will be in a saturation region. So in our case, since VDS and VGS they are same, and VTN is a positive quantity, so it satisfies the condition. So both the MOS transistor M1 and M2 are in saturation. So we can write M1 and M2 are in saturation region. And another one thing, see both the transistors are connected in series. So the current is same. So in saturation region, the drain current of MOSFET IG equal to that is basically kn by 2 kn dash by 2 into w by l into vgs minus vtn square neglecting the channel length modulation effect because uh, the channel length modulation parameter is not mentioned here so we assume lambda equal to zero so no one plus lambda vds term will not appear here so since id1 and id2 they are same so we can write kn dash by 2 into w by l of one into vgs one minus gtn square equal to for mos two k n dash by two w by l of two into vgs two minus gtn square so since k n that parameter is same for both so this one and this one will be cancelled this one and this one will be cancelled so we can write vgs1 minus vt n equal to vgs2 minus vt n that means that means vgs1 minus vgs2 that is equal to zero okay so from this equation we can uh, say vgs1 minus vgs2 that is equal to zero that means very simple so vgs1 that is equal to vgs2 Okay. Now take a look. The VGS one, that is the gate to source voltage of the MOSFET one. So that is nothing but gate is connected to five volt. Check here. The gate is connected to five volt and source is connected to V naught. So VGS one equal to five minus V naught. So VGS one equal to five minus V naught. So that is equal to VGS two. 
and that is equal to c the vgs2 the vgs2 is nothing but gate minus source source is grounded gate is connected to v0 okay so vgs2 equal to v0 okay so just i'm writing it separately so vgs1 equal to this one vgs2 equal to this since vgs1 equal to vgs2 so phi minus v0 will be equal to v0 so it will give 2 v naught equal to 5. That means v naught equal to 5 by 2, that is 2.5. So this is the answer. So in this way, we can solve it. So in this tutorial, I will explain the structure of MOS capacitor its operation and the capacitance voltage characteristics. So MOS capacitor is basically a two terminal MOS structure. That means the basic metal oxide semiconductor structure as shown in this figure. So you can check. As you know that the MOS stands for metal oxide semiconductor. So the whole structure behaves like a parallel plate capacitor where metal gate behaves like one plate. And at the bottom, the semiconductor behaves like another one plate. And in between metal and semiconductor, there is a dielectric layer, uh, which you can say that oxide layer. So basically, it forms a parallel plate capacitor. And you know the parallel plate capacitor, the capacitance, uh, the general expression for capacitance, that is basically C equal to epsilon A by T, where T is the distance between two plates. Now, if you carefully observe the structure of a MOS state, MOS capacitor, so it basically consists of two different capacitances and they are connected in series. The first capacitance will come due to this, uh, this oxide, due to the presence of this oxide layer. Okay, so here we can say that this capacitor COX, so COX basically, that uh, uh, we are saying it is the oxide capacitance per unit area. It is the oxide capacitance per unit area. So that is basically epsilon zero into epsilon OX by TOX. And second part, the CS. The CS is the semiconductor capacitance. CS is basically the semiconductor capacitance. Now in this structure, the COX is constant. That means for a particular thickness of oxide layer and dielectric constant, the COX value is always constant. But depending upon the voltage you are applying at the gate terminal with respect to the substrate, the value of CS will change. Because uh, suppose you are applying some positive voltage, as you know that the negative charge, the inversal layer will be formed here. And the total amount of charge present in the inversal layer that depends upon the amount of voltage you are applying at the gate terminal. So depending upon the bias voltage, the value of CS will change. And also at the same time, on depletion layer is created at the bottom of this oxide layer, because when you are applying some positive gate voltage, so first the holes are rippled back into the substrate and a depletion layer is created. So CS basically bias dependent term, so which varies uh, due to the applied gate voltage or more specifically, uh, along with the surface potential. So the total capacitance, so we can uh, say that is the gate capacitance. So if we give the term gate capacitance, or the total capacitance of the small structure, so that is CG equal to the parallel, the series combination, okay, that is COX, okay, and CS, that is COX into CS, by COX plus CS. Because you know when the capacitor in a series, so the equivalent capacitance is COX into CS by COX plus CS. Or also you can write it in this form, one by CG equal to one by COX plus one by CS in this form. So this, this equation gives the total gate capacitance, CG. And when we establish this equation, just remember that we are not considering that uh, the trapped charge or the oxide interface charge. As you know that the oxide is not a pure, always there are some positive uh, charges are present inside the oxide layer. And due to the presence of the charge, 
uh, that uh, the gate capacitance also affected. But uh, considering the oxide layer is ideal in nature, so there is no such uh, trapped charge, oxide interface charge is present. So the contribution of those charges are zero. So we got this equation, one by Cg equal to one by Cox plus one by Cs. Now let us explore uh, the when we are varying the gate voltage uh, from a negative uh, to some positive value, how this uh, Cg value will vary along with the applied gate voltage. So that is basically the capacitance voltage characteristics. Okay. Now in case one, when we are applying a negative gate voltage, so let's come here to case one. The gate voltage Vg less than K. V at B actually. So V at B is the flat band voltage, which I already discussed in the MOSFET chapter. So when Vg is less than V at B, and if we consider it is uh, that uh, semiconductor is P type, that means it is NMOS capacitor. Okay, so V at B basically is a negative value. And when Vg less than VFB, then basically when you are applying some negative voltage here, what will happen? And it is a P-type semiconductor. The majority carrier holes are attracted towards this interface because this surface uh, is a uh, negative. You are applying some negative gate voltage. So majority carrier holes are attracted towards this and uh, they form one layer. The name of this layer is called accumulation layer. Okay, so in summary, we can say that through the majority carriers, that is holes are accumulated accumulated near oxide interface. Okay. And in due to this, and when a large number of holes are present near this oxide interface, then see the electric field that which arises due to the applied gate voltage, those electric field will terminate here and they will not reach up to the substrate terminal. Okay, so this is basically the electric field screening effect. So when a large amount of holes are present here due to a sufficient negative gate voltage, the electric field okay, will be terminated here, that is in the, uh, this, and this in the accumulation layer. Okay, so then in this condition, the value of Cg is equal to Cox. The semiconductor capacitance Cs will not come into the picture because the electric field is terminated just after the oxide layer. And when you are just increasing the value of Vg, okay, uh, slightly towards the positive direction, then less amount of hole will be present near the oxide layer and at the same time that some of the electric field lines will reach at the substrate terminal and then some finite value of Cs will come and see if, since the Cs is series combination of Cox that means the capacitance value K okay, will decrease from Cox. Okay. So at strong accumulation region the value of Cg almost equal to Cox and after that the value reduces. So if I plot that, okay, so this is a positive Vg, so this is negative Vg. In the accumulation region, uh, let uh, if I draw this, this is a uh, VAP, okay. So after VAP in this direction, so the value of Cg almost equal to Cox, and after that it will fall like this. So this is uh, Cg graph, and this one is Cox. So this is the situation occurs in accumulation region. Now coming to the next one, when we are applying some small positive gate voltage, Vg greater than zero, that is a Vg is greater than zero, then due to the presence of this positive charge, 
the majority carrier, again I'm saying this is a p-type subscript, the majority carrier holes will be rippled back into the substrate and as a result, they lead fixed negative ions, which creates a depletion layer. Okay. Now see, we have a situation due to the presence of depletion layer, some finite value of CS will come and this, uh, in another way we can say that the equivalent oxide thickness increases because the depletion layer gets like a diuretic, so the equivalent oxide thickness increases, so capacitance reduces. So as you can see here, okay, in the transition from accumulation region to depletion layer, depletion region, okay, so the capacitance decreases. And the capacitance will be minimum when the thickness of this depletion layer is maximum. Okay. So the Vg greater than zero, that is small. So this is called depletion. Okay, and when depletion layer thickness, X depletion is maximum, which gives the minimum gate capacitance, Cg min. In the next condition, when the applied gate voltage is sufficiently large, that is Vg greater than zero, the large. Then of course in that condition, the depletion layer thickness will be maximum, but at the same time, the minority carrier, that is free electrons are present in, inside this P-type substrate, they form the inversion layer here. So there will be some free electron in this layer. Okay. And if that value, if the density of electron is quite large, then again, similar to accumulation layer, the electric field will be terminated here, because this uh, behaves like a conducting layer, the inversion layer, so the electric field which appears from the gate terminal, and they will be terminated in the inversion layer. So again, we have a situation where Cg almost equal to Cox. But here, another one situation will come. When you are applying some AC voltage, especially when we are doing the CV characteristics, when we are measuring the CV characteristics, so we are applying some uh, AC signal at the gate terminal. If the frequency of the AC signal, the gate voltage, basically we are applying some AC, gate, AC voltage at the gate terminal. If the frequency of the applied gate voltage is very small, a few hertz, then that uh, it will follow the inversion layer, whatever the changes in the inversion layer, it will follow the gate voltage. But if the frequency of the gate voltage is quite large, then the inversion layer will unable to follow the variation in gate voltage. So this effect is called the non quasi static effect. Okay. So if there is a sudden change in gate voltage, the inversion layer unable to follow that variation in gate voltage and the capacitance remain at the minimum position. So that is equal to uh, that uh, Cg min. So if I plot that final graph of CV characteristics, so this is the gate voltage and this is the capacitance Cg. Okay. So uh, here I can take this axis as a flat band voltage, VFB. So up to VFB, so that capacitance is almost equal to COX, CG equal to COX. Okay. So this region, uh, you know that this region is called accumulation. This is the accumulation region. After that, the depletion layer will come and the overall capacitance will fall like this. Okay. So this region is the depletion region. And then we have two different cases. After that, uh, when the inversion layer uh, will gradually appears, then again the capacitor will arise, capacitance will arise, and again it will be equal to the C waves, a strong inversion layer. Okay. But this is the situation for low frequency CV analysis. That means when you are applying a gate voltage, which frequency is small enough. Okay. But when you are applying a very high frequency, 
the inversion layer unable to follow that change and the capacitance remain at the minimum position that means it will be like this so the second graph means this one this one is for high frequency so the accumulation and depletion that part remains same only the difference is in the inversion layer okay when the frequency of applied air voltage is quite small then again it will it, it can follow the variation in the gate voltage and again the capacitance will increase but if the applied gate voltage frequency is very high the inversion layer unable to track that due to the non quasi static effect and the gate capacitance will be at the minimum position so that is basically cg bin so cg max the maximum gate capacitance so that is nothing but the cox okay so this one is the cg max and the cg mean that is defined by the cox as well as the cs that is basically the width of the depletion layer when the width of the depletion layer is maximum you will get the minimum gate capacitance following the equation 1 by cg equal to 1 by c waves plus 1 by cs okay where you know c o x equal to epsilon o x by t o x of course the epsilon waves means uh, it's, it should be multiplied by epsilon zero and the semiconductor capacitance under depletion condition okay that means c s mean that is permittivity of the semiconductor epsilon this one by t max where t max is the maximum width of depletion layer in that condition you will get the same thing. so if i point out uh, some region in the cv characteristics so let us see so this region basically this region a this region is a region b and this region let it is region c so i can tell that in region a the most is in accumulation in region b it is in depletion and in region c the most is in inversion at low frequency but if the graph looks like this one, okay, then the MOS capacitor is in inversion, but is that for high frequency? So two different types of graphs may be possible okay, for this MOS cap, depending upon the frequency of the gate voltage you are applying. So let's solve one problem from this. Suppose we have a MOS capacitor with oxide thickness of 10 nanometer. That means, uh, so let's see, it's the problem. So we have POX equal to 10 nanometer. Yeah. The maximum depletion layer thickness equal to 100 nanometer. So T depletion equal to 100 nanometer. And the permittivity of the semiconductor and oxide layer is epsilon S and epsilon OX. And epsilon S by epsilon OX is the ratio is three. So then find out the ratio of maximum capacitance then is cg max by cg mean equal to how much we have to calculate this one so cg max that is nothing but cox that is epsilon ox by tox that is equal to that value epsilon ox keep it by t ox means 10 nanometer 10 into 10 to the power minus 9 okay Six. and it will be farad per meter so i'm not going to put that because because we are going to calculate that ratio so in the unit is not important okay so next one i'm going to calculate cg mean okay CG mean. So CG mean equal to basically, so we can use this formula 1 by CG 
equal to 1 by COX plus 1 by CS. And here CS means it will be CS mean because the depletion layer thickness match is maximum, so which will give the minimum semiconductor capacitance. Okay. So here you can calculate that is CG mean equal to okay, that is C1, C2, that is CS mean into COX by CS mean plus COX. So you can just put the value. CS mean means epsilon S by T depletion. And again, epsilon S means three times of epsilon waves. So three epsilon waves by T depletion means 100 nanometer into into COX, that is epsilon OX by, oh, let's do that here. That is three times of epsilon OX by 100 into 10 to the power minus nine into COX, that is epsilon OX by TOX, that is 10 nanometer, 10 into 10 to the power minus nine, divided by CS mean, that is epsilon S, that is three times of epsilon OX by 100 nanometer plus COX, that is epsilon OX by 10 into 10 to the power minus nine. So you can simplify that and finally, I'm going to calculate CG max by CG mean. Just divide this and this divided by this. So it will be 13 by three. You can simplify that and ultimately see at the numerator denominator, you will get epsilon OX term, which will be canceled. And it will be 13 by three. That is 4.33. So in this way, we can solve it.